Hallelujah. Praise God. Welcome once again to another time of teaching. We've been looking at access and divine wisdom. Access and divine wisdom. How to be led of God. Let's begin with prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask for revelation knowledge to dawn upon our hearts. Let words and thoughts from heaven flow freely through me to your people. Let these words and thoughts continue to speak to us beyond this moment. And let signs and wonders be done in the name of your holy child, Jesus. For it's in Jesus' mighty and precious name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Hallelujah. Believe with me as we look into God's word. Let's look at what we've covered so far. We've been talking about divine wisdom. First of all, we the whole um, series of teachings and why we're teaching along this line is because Jesus said in Matthew 13 and verse 52, he said um, that a scribe who understands how the kingdom of heaven works, I'm paraphrasing, will be able to bring out whatever is necessary or needed. He'll be able to bring out whatever is needed. Put old things, keep them going, and new things being added. And so we all need to know how the kingdom of God operates. And one of those areas is faith. So we talked about faith, how to use your faith. And now we're talking about wisdom. And <clears throat> we, before now, we have looked at why wisdom is important. The Bible says wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get it. And with all your getting, get understanding. So wisdom is important because the Bible says so. Apart from that, the Bible actually tells us why it's important. It said, exalt her, she will promote you. Proverbs chapter 4 from verse 8. She will bring you honor when you embrace her. She will place on your head an ornament of grace. A crown of glory she will deliver to you. Proverbs 24, 3 to 7 says, True wisdom, a house is built. All right. And by understanding it is established, and by knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. A wise man is strong. So, we have, we have established the fact that uh, wisdom is important. And so we talked about what wisdom is. Wisdom is knowing the will of God. Wisdom is what God would have done in your shoes. And we showed that from the word of God. The Bible says in Ephesians 5 verse 17, Ephesians 5 17, Therefore, do not be unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. So the will of God in any situation is the wisdom for that situation. If God wants you to travel, the wise thing to do will be travel. If God wants you to start a business, the wise thing to do will be start a business. If God wants you to advertise more, the wise thing to do, wisdom in that situation, will be to advertise more your business. All right? And we said, why is it that God's will is wisdom in any given situation? Because the Bible says that God is the only wise God, 1 Timothy 1 verse 17. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise. So God alone is wise. So wisdom is not something God shares with, you know, that, that you know, there are so many, like, wisdom is not something that God has more than others. It's what God alone has. So Wisdom, therefore, is what God will do in a situation. Because God alone is wise. So anyone whose thoughts or decisions contradicts what God would have done will be unwise. That's why the Bible says, do not be unwise, but understand the will of the Lord. Whatever situation you are facing, what God would have done in that situation is what wisdom is. So being able to access God's mind, in any given situation, is accessing wisdom. Being able to access, I'll say it again, God's mind in any given situation is how you access wisdom. Hallelujah. Praise God. All right. So Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 5 to 6, we did read that as well. Just laying the foundation of the things we've already done so that we can build on that today. Surely I have... I have taught you statutes and judgments just as the Lord my God commanded me that you should act according to them in the land which you go to possess. Therefore be careful to observe them for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say surely this great nation is a wise, see that word, an understanding people. So God is saying 
I've given you statutes, I've given you judgments, I've given you in the written word my opinion. That's what judgments are. That's why the a court of law, um, in the Supreme Court, when the judge is giving his judgment, they will say it's his opinion, that this judge gave his opinion, that judge gave his opinion. So they call them opinions. So when God says, I've given you my judgments, and I've given you my opinions in the word. What do I think about the different issues? What do I think should be done under different circumstances? I've given you my opinion. What I would have done if I were in your shoes. I won't steal if I were in your shoes. I'll never steal from someone else. I will not cheat some I will not cheat somebody else. So I've told you, do not steal, do not cheat, do not lie. Because I won't do that. And so doing that will be unwise. So he says, I've given you my statutes and my judgments. Now keep them. And if you keep them, the world will say these are a wise and understanding people. One, because of your results. So that also tells us another in, from another angle that what God would have done in a situation is what wisdom is. So how do we then access the mind of Christ? So we said already that the beginning of that journey to accessing the mind of Christ is the fear of God. So let's, uh, uh, Job 28, verse 20 to 20. I'm going to read the whole thing. Um, and I'm going to read the voice translation of it. The voice translation of it says, Then from where does wisdom come? Where does understanding dwell? She is hidden away from every eye, even from birds looking down from the sky. Destruction and death have both confessed. Rumors are all we know about her. God understands wisdom's path and way. Her place is known to him alone. For he gazes out to the edge of the earth, sees all the falls beneath the sky overhead. He lent the wind its weight and force and measured out the water spread. When he set a limit on the rain that falls and made the thunderbolt a road to race. Then he saw wisdom and made her known and settled her. So in doing all these things, he, he, he knows how things work. That's why the Bible says, then he saw wisdom. He knows how things work. He put all this in place. He created the things we see. He, he, he's the one that set the, the cause of things in motion. So he knows how it works. So in, in the way these things work, God saw what wisdom, what body of knowledge would be wisdom. Do you understand that? Then he saw wisdom and made her known. He settled her and searched out for her a place. And to humankind he said, Now the fear of the Lord is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. Proverbs 9 verse 10 to 12 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For by me, wisdom is speaking now, your days will be multiplied, and years of life will be added to you. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. And if you scoff, you will bear it alone. Okay. So these are the things we've covered already. This is the beginning of the journey to accessing the mind of God, accessing divine wisdom in any given situation. So let's take it a, a step further today. Let's look at some scriptures and then we will go into detailed discussion. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30. So the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 30, But of him you are in Christ Jesus, of God. In other words, you are a product of God. You came of God, but you are in Christ Jesus. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, righteous and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. So I want you to think about that for a moment. He said, Christ has been made unto us 
wisdom, righteousness, redemption, and sanctification. That means that wisdom is as much available without any preconditions as righteousness is. What did you need? What was the precondition to qualify to be made righteous? None. Jesus died, shed his blood, and you are made righteous. And all you've got to do is pray and ask Jesus to come into your heart. <clears throat> and you become righteous. It's, you are more, you're doing more of receiving it than trying to earn it. There is no earning righteousness. You can't do something to qualify for righteousness. You can't do something to qualify for redemption. It was done. It's a done deal. What you do for righteousness is receive it when you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. What you do for redemption is to receive it. And the same way, wisdom, you have already been qualified for it. And the point we're trying to make is a very vital point because some people say, Oh, I made the mistake, I've not lived the right life, I've not made the right decisions, I've not, you know, I've not been holy enough, I've not, you know. If you can't say that about righteousness, if you can't say I've not been holy enough so I cannot give my life to Christ, or I've not behaved well so I cannot receive Jesus as my Lord and become righteous. If you can't say that about righteousness, you can't say that about wisdom. You can't say, oh, I was the one that made the mistake, God, God spoke to me. God told me what to do. I didn't do it. That's why heaven has been silent. That's a lie. Somebody may have lied to you or you may have come up with it yourself. That idea that because you did not obey the last instruction that God gave you, so now God has gone silent on you, will mean that Christ has not been made unto us wisdom, and we have to qualify for the divine direction. We have to qualify to get the mind of God on any issue. So that's one of the first things you must settle. You must settle that the fact that wisdom is yours, not because of your qualification, but because of what Jesus has done for you. Christ has been made unto us wisdom. So, do we need to pray about it? Do we have a role to play in receiving it? Yes. The same way you had a role to play in receiving righteousness. Not everyone in the world has been made righteous. But everyone in the world has qualified, regardless of their sins, to receive righteousness. But not everyone has received it. So, they will die and still go to hell as if no one died for them. The same way somebody can walk in foolishness who is a believer... As if Christ has not been made unto him wisdom. But you must first believe and understand that the wisdom is being delivered on the premise of grace. Not on the premise of performance. So even if you have disobeyed every instruction that God gave you since your mother's womb. I mean, while you were in your mother's womb, God told you don't grab the umbilical cord, you grabbed it. God said, okay, now you are about to be born. Let go of your umbilical cord. You came out with it in your, with your, in your hand. God told you, okay, now let go. Let us, you took it and tied around the doctor. Squeezed as a baby. You disobeyed every single leading. Every single direction. You are still a candidate for wisdom. Because it's not based on what you did. Is based on what he did. Somebody shout hallelujah. <clears throat> Even if you have, God told you start a business, you didn't. God told you plant a church, you didn't. If you go back to God and say, God, I'm here now. What do you want me to do? He will still tell you what to do. Why? Because he will be unjust to not do that. Because Christ has been made unto us wisdom. What we do now is receive it. And God will always give it. Look at this. James chapter 1 and verse 5. We're going to come back to it again. When we start going through the steps for receiving. 
But James chapter 1 verse 5, look at this. <clears throat> it says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given him. No consideration about whether you obeyed the last one. Like some people tell us, you know, the one God, the last instruction God gave you, have you obeyed it? Then why should he give you another instruction? No. He that would be that would be God giving with re, with reproach. With reproach. Let, let me let me let me help you understand that word reproach. Let me let me read you the different uh, meanings of that word without reproach, so you understand it. James chapter one verse five. I'm going to read directly from the dictionary of that word in the King James version. It says, "If any of you lack wisdom, James one and verse five." Let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally. Liberally. Liberally means abundantly. There is no preconditions. Liberally. Said that we have too much of it to give. Come and take. Then he says, without, and King James says, and upbraideth not. What the New King James translated as without reproach. Upbraideth not. So let's look at that word that was translated as without reproach. It means, it's from a Greek word, oneidiso. It means to disparage, to reproach. Generally, it means to rail at, revile, assail with abusive words. It's what your parents, most of us grew up with parents who did this. You, you know, and that's why we see God, we think of God like that. We grew up with parents who you will say, mom, can I, uh, 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 please, should I, should I, should I go ahead and buy the biscuit uh, um, for the party? So why are you asking me? Why are you asking me? The one I told you yesterday, did you obey me? You're not obeying me. You're not an obedient child. So why do you now want to hear my next instruction? Now, most of us can think of our parents talking that way. And we think of God that way. But that's not who God is. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally and upbraided not. Why? Because Christ has been made unto you wisdom. God cannot withhold wisdom from you. And so that's why the Bible says and upbraided not, and it shall, not it might, not it could, it shall be given him. Why is this important? Why is this knowledge important? Because he that cometh to God must first believe that he is. Wisdom is received on the premise of faith. Hebrews 11 and verse 6. He that cometh to God, whoever is seeking God, must first believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So do you have to seek? Yes. Do you have to seek God to get wisdom? Yes. But wisdom is yours already. Wisdom belongs to you. You don't qualify for it. And it's the same way if I transfer $50 billion into your account. You don't qualify. You don't have to go work to earn it. But you have to go get it. Right? You have to get into the car, drive somewhere, use an ATM, or go to the bank itself, write a check. All of that action is not to qualify. It's to appropriate what is already yours. So everything we do regarding wisdom is not to qualify for it. Stop thinking that there's something that maybe is the reason why you don't qualify. And focus on the fact that you're just appropriating. You are taking what is already yours. Glory be to God. So it says, He that cometh to God must first believe, Hebrews 11 number 6, that he is and that is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So you have to diligently seek God, yes. But that is to take, because, remember James 1 and verse 5, he that, if any of you lack wisdom, so it is possible to not have wisdom in an issue, regarding an issue, even though wisdom belongs to you. The same way it's possible for you to have 50 billion in the account and not have money in your pocket. And have to go make a withdrawal. But you're, you're never worried. If you have no money in your pocket. Because you have money in the bank. 
So you are never worried. You simply go make a withdrawal. You simply make a withdrawal. That's what you do. We don't get worried. If you have 50 billion in the, in the account and nothing in your pocket, you just say, give me some time. That's why Daniel could, Daniel could say to Nebuchadnezzar, give me some time. He tapped into what you and I own. He tapped into some, some people in, in dispensations before ours in the Old Testament tapped into New Testament dispensation uh, 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 realities. Like Abraham was considered righteous because he believed. That's not for that dispensation. It was for the New Testament guys. But Abraham tapped into it. Enoch was taken and he was not for, for God took him. That's, that's a New Testament. We are going to be raptured and taken like that. Glory to God. But he tapped into it. And Daniel told the king, you know, don't kill anybody. Don't, don't worry yourself. I will go pray and come back. Because it's, it's, it's there. I just need to go make a withdrawal. You need to have that mindset because you need to operate in faith. Faith is the prerequisite. The only prerequisite is not your conduct, is not whether you obeyed God in the past, is that he that cometh to God must first believe that he is and that is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Proverbs 4 verse 16. Proverbs 4 verse 16. Romans rather. Romans 4 and verse 16. I want to show you some things. Wisdom, like every other gift of grace, is received by faith. Romans 4 verse 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace. So anything that Christ has made available for us is, is on the premise of grace, no longer on the premise of works. Like your healing is not based on your works. Like your prosperity is not based on your works. You don't qualify. You receive it by working, but you don't qualify because you work. It's already your inheritance. Colossians 3 and verse 24. Whatever your hand finds to do, verse 23, do with all your heart. Not as men pleasers or with eye service, for, but from the heart. He said, for from the Lord you will receive the reward of your inheritance. It's already your inheritance. But he says, servants, obey your masters in the Lord. Can you see that? Servants, obey your masters. Servants, obey your masters, not as men pleasers. Not, as, not with eye service. Whatever your hand finds to do, do with all your heart for those your masters. For from the Lord you will receive your inheritance as you are working. In other words, even though you are getting it through the work, you are not getting it, you do, the work is not what qualifies you. Are you getting this? He that was poor, rich became poor, that you through his poverty might, might be made rich. That's how you qualified for prosperity. But it is delivered to you as you create value. You are receiving not just your pay, you are receiving your inheritance. You are receiving your inheritance as you create value. As you create value for your masters, whether it is a somebody employing you or it is you are the owner of the business and the customer is your master, you are serving someone. We are all serving somebody. And you serve with all your heart. You go over and beyond, all right, as unto the Lord. And when you are operating like that, you receive beyond whatever this system will pay you. You receive from heaven it, in itself the reward of your inheritance from the Lord. All right. So the same principle applies. So that's why James said, if you lack wisdom, ask. It doesn't mean that the asking is how you qualify. The asking is how you withdraw. So everything that is of grace might be, must be by faith. It is of faith that it might be by grace so that the promise may be sure to all the seed. You know, all right. So we've, we've established this. Nobody should ever say that I don't qualify. There's a reason why. I didn't obey the last instruction. We've, I, the, that teaching has gone on in the body of Christ for a long time and it's time for it to die. Amen. Now, the Bible says, and here's where we're going to begin to dig now into what exactly do you do? Everything so far has been preparing you. What exactly do you do in order to receive divine direction? You want to know what to do about a given situation. 
What exact, exactly do you begin to do? Proverbs 20. So this is the first statement I'm going to make. Wisdom is delivered. Divine direction is delivered through your spirit. I'm going to explain that, but let's look at the scriptures. To prove what I said is true, then we'll explain it. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. Please hear this. The, if we say, for instance, praise God, If we say, for instance, that a particular device, your phone, most of us have touch lights on our phones now. If we say that your phone is your touch light, and through it you are able to dispel darkness and see what the way things really are, it means that if the, the phone is your touch light, that means you don't have another touch light. You don't have another whatever. The, the main way that you dispel darkness and cause there to be knowledge of the way things really are, which is what light does. Light makes you know the way things really are. Light does not move the table. Light does not rearrange the chairs. If you walk into a room, you can stumble on the table, stumble on the chairs. You can slip on a, a, a banana peel on the floor. You can slip, be, uh, uh, slip because of the... Uh, 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 water that is on the floor because you don't know where things are, you don't know the state of things, but the moment you turn on the light, now you can see the way things are, the banana peel is not moved, it is still there, but you can see it is there, the table is, has not been moved it's still there, but you can see it is there, you can avoid it, so light brings knowledge of the way things really are, and what you should do, obviously so Bible says that the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord is the touch light of the Lord like the way we said, your phone is your touch light. Your phone is your touch light. So when God wants to give you illumination, when God wants you to know the way things really are, and so come up and so def and therefore know what to do, what God works with is your spirit. And why is that important? Because there are people who think that God primarily speaks through, for instance, dreams. Dreaming is not a spiritual activity. That has been proven because even science has been able to study dreams to a very high degree. I can play you a, a movie. I can play a movie beside you and you will be dreaming. Some of you have had seen this happen before. You will be dreaming of the words coming from that movie maybe in a different setting. Maybe now it's your father talking to you, biological father. In the dream and he's saying with me without me with me without me without me with me and if you've watched movies if you're a movie buff like myself that came from night and day by Tom Cruise and you see your dad but instead of saying with me without me the way Tom Cruise acted it he might say with me somebody's dancing without me with me without me mm -mm. with me without me mm -mm. but you're, you're, you're hearing the same thing in the dream in a different context because, and that has been proven, many of you have experienced it. I remember uh, um, there was a time uh, my, my younger sister was, uh, uh, was sleeping and we were watching the TV till late. Back then they used to, they would close at 12 and then they would say the national anthem and they had played to Nigeria, my country. And that's how they, the, the national pledge and national anthem is how they close the TV station for the for the day. And so she slept off and we were watching TV. And then the moment they got to the national anthem, she just stood up from the where she was sleeping, stood straight like you know in class, like in school assembly, stood straight, and then they sang the national anthem. And then when it was time for the, the pledge, she did like this, and then she took the pledge, and then she did this, and then she went back to sleep. And she had no recollection of it. She was just simply dreaming. Maybe she was in school or something. But it was a dream. And she was acting out the dream. Um, 
people, it's been proven that what you eat at night can affect your dream. If you go at night and eat some heavy, heavy meal, it can affect your dream. The last thoughts on your mind can affect your dream. Does that mean that God can never talk to you through a dream? No, it means that that's not, that's not, that can never be the primary way you get to know what God is saying. You can have dreams that make no sense. You can have dreams that are from the wicked one. Satan also influences dreams because it's within the sphere of what he can control. You can have a dream that your grandmother is the one that is behind your predicament and she has no clue about it. And you wake up with such conviction, no, it's my grandmother, and you start, you know. So, there are people that feel dreams is how God, the, the dreams are the candle of the Lord. No. Your spirit, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. There are people that think that their mind is the candle of the Lord. That if they think something and are convinced about it in their mind, that must be God. Because God must allow them to think of it. That you thought of something does not mean it's the right thing to do. I mean, come on. Everything you've done in your past, even the ones that were mystics, you thought about it. Nobody ever just got up and did something without thinking. Just, I didn't think about that. I didn't think about, are you kidding me? <laughs> Those mistakes you made in the past, you sat down, you thought about it, and you were fully convinced it was the right thing to do. And you did it, and it turned out to be the wrong thing to do. Some people think their thoughts are the candle of the Lord. No, your mind is not the candle of the Lord. Some people think their bodies are the candle of the Lord. Your body is not the candle of the Lord. So stop saying things like, oh, you know, I wanted to give him some money and my right hand was twitching, so maybe I shouldn't. Or my left hand was twitching, so maybe I shouldn't. Or my, you know, I wanted to go out, but my left leg began to twitch, so I, I'm not supposed to go out. My right leg begins to twitch, yeah, I'm supposed to go out. Well, somebody says, well, you know, I, I was going to uh, I, I go... Uh, out and then my left eye began to twitch so i'm going to see something bad god is telling me i'm going to see something bad my left if my right eye is twitching i'm going to see something good if my palms my right palm is twitching, i'm going to get something good my left palm is twitching, i'm going to i'm going to have something something i'm going to lose something i mean there are all kinds of crazy stuff out there people using their body as the spirit as the the candle of the lord your emotions are not the candle of the Lord. Your emotions are not how God leads you. Someone say, wow, if this is wrong, how can it feel so good? Huh? If it's wrong, how can it feel so good? <laughs> I, feel, I feel sorry for you. The guy opens the car door for you, you know, he does all of those things and he's a monster where your destiny is concerned. He's, he's the patrol of the fire to consume your destiny and destroy it. But he, he opens the car doors. He does all of those things. And it feels so good. You know? Someone says, oh, if this is right, if this is wrong, I don't want to be right. This feels so good. Your feelings are not the candle of the Lord. Your emotions are not the candle of the Lord. And all you've got to do is objectively look back at when you felt so sure that somebody was wrong and it turned out was right. When you felt that somebody was right and it turned out to be wrong, you felt it. Your feelings are not the candle of the Lord. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. So, if you are going to tap into wisdom, you need to go beyond how you feel, go beyond the dream, go beyond what you are thinking, go beyond your analysis and logic, go beyond the, 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 how, you, how your body is responding at any given time, and you're going to have to tap into your spirit. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. 
How do you then tap into your spirit? So, number one, let me quickly give this to you. You can start practicing this now. You're born again. The spirit of God is in you. So, here is how you tap into wisdom in your spirit. The spirit of man is where God deposits light. How do you access that light? Let's go. Number one, James 1 and verse 5. Ask God in faith. Ask God in faith. So, go before God. Don't pray any of those unbelieving prayers. Don't go before God and say, God, there's a song we used to sing when we want to hear God back then. Speak it to me, Lord Jesus. Me need to hear from you. If you know, speak, Lord Jesus. Me no know what to do. Oh, Lord, speak it to me, Lord Jesus. Me need to hear from you. If you know, speak, Lord Jesus. Me no know what to do. It has a Hawaiian feel. A good danceable song. But that's all it, all it does. The only, good for, the only good thing in that song is that you can dance to it. If you can extract, extra, remove the, the words of those songs and just dance to the beats better. Because that song is nonsense. That song is, is embalmed with unbelief. If you know speak, no. That, that is an, that's an unbelieving statement. Remember James 1 and verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of the Lord. Who gives liberally and upbraided not, without reproach, without insults, without reviling, without attacking you. And it shall be given him, not it might or could. And so that song has already taken you off faith. If you know speak, are you kidding me? He will. He that, be, he that come to God must first believe that he is and is a rewarder of those who seek him. Everyone who seeks him will be rewarded with what they are seeking. So asking faith. Asking faith means get into faith, then ask. So go to that James 1 and verse 5 and meditate on it and let it sink in your seed for yourself. Remember I told you when you hear... My son, give attention to my words, incline your ears to my sayings. Now, don't let them depart from your eyes. So when you hear, move to see him. Open the Bible for yourself. Don't say pastor said, pastor quoted, pastor said. No, open the Bible, James 1 and verse 5. Go read it and read it and read it and read it and let it become one with you. Oh, hallelujah. Ah, uh, that's the man I meet now. It's a heavy statement. Let that word become one with you. I want to read you something. In Second Samuel, chapter 23. I never saw this until recently, but this will bless you. Believe me, I'm going to go out of my way to drop that and then come back to what we're saying. This thing about the word of God becoming one with you. Second Samuel chapter 23 and verse 10. Okay. Okay, from verse 10. Um, let's start from verse 8 for just for clarity, but verse 10 is the key scripture. There are, these are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Joseph Bashibet, the Tachmonite, chief among the captains. He was also called Adino the Esnite. Because he had killed 800 men at one time. And after him was Eliezer, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite, one of the three mighty men with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle. And the, and the men of Israel had retreated. He arose, this, this Eliezer, the son of Dodo, is the person we are talking about. He arose and attacked the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand stuck to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day and the people returned after him only to plunder. His hand stuck to the sword and that, that God administered that to me lately through one of his servants. To think about it, he was tired, but his hand became one with that sword. You couldn't tell where the sword ended and where his hand began. He was grabbing the sword 
But even in his tiredness, he couldn't let go. His hand had formed around the sword. He became one with it. That's what you've got to do with the word of God. You've got to take, Bible says, and taking upon you the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You've got to meditate on it. That even when you are tired, everything around you is, is looking like no way. You feel like giving up, but you can't. You can't because you have become one with the word. No matter how tired you are, you can't. Because you become one with it. You, you, you have, how do you say that it is not so? How, do, how can you now say that you are not healed? You have become one with by his stripes you are healed. You will be denying yourself and lying to yourself because you've become one with that word. You've seen it to be true. And you, are, you may not understand why you have not yet received your healing. You may not understand why there's still a manifestation of sickness in your body. But you can't deny that by his stripes you are healed. Because you become one with it. That's what you do with the word. And to do that, it can't be somebody said. Nobody can wield the sword on your behalf. You've got that in your hand. Somebody can stand with you and cut down the enemy for you. But the sword in your hand is your main defense. Nobody's going to wield the sword in your hand. That's why you have to set your eyes on it. So you go to James 1 and verse 5. And you meditate on it. And you read it and read it and say it and read it and say it and read it. Until that part that says it shall be given him becomes one with you. That part that says... He gives liberally and upbraided not. Becomes one with you. Now you are in faith. Then ask. You see, many people ask and then plan to get in faith. No, get in faith and then ask. If I tell, if I told you, cook that, those eggs in water. What do you do? Do you put the eggs in the pot first and start cooking? Then ask, go looking for water. No, you put the water first. The eggs go in the water. Then the cooking starts. If you say ask in faith, cook in water, you get water in first. Ask in faith, you get faith in first. Then you start asking. Today you are asking in faith. I hope that blessed somebody. That really stirred my spirit. So ask in faith. Say, Father, how do you do that? Father, in the name of Jesus, I have these issues I need clarity about. And you are the only wise God. And James 1 and verse 5, that I've been meditating on, it's clear that if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives liberally and abraded not, and shall be given him. So I thank you, but as I ask, it shall be given me. I'm asking that, should I travel or should I stay? Should I marry her or should I not? Should I marry Titi or should I not? Should I marry Tolu or should I not? Should I marry Nkim or should I not? Should I marry Nema or should I not? Is this guy that is coming to me okay, the right person or not should I even bother should I go ahead or should I not go ahead you are making inquiries and when you say that you say father thank you because this I have this answer in Jesus name oh hallelujah 